Thanks for joining us on another edition of the program, Guest of the Week. My name is Jane Madwabuna. A warm welcome to you. On this edition, my guest is a distinguished professor of international law and global politics, professor and former distinguished visiting scholar at the School of Law, University of Kansas, USA. A quick look at his educational background shows that he obtained his first school living certificate from Green Street Primary School, Abba, in Abia State. From there, he attended Wilcourse Memorial Comprehensive Secondary School, Obo Hill, Abba, Abia State, for his West Africa School Certificate. He obtained his bachelor's degree in Agricultural Economics from University of Benin, here in Nigeria. He had two master's degree. First was in Business Administration, Marketing Option, from River State University, Port Harcourt. And the second was in Law and Diplomacy from same university, River State, Port Harcourt. He also obtained a double PhD degree. And the first is in Integration Processes from University of Naples to Italy. The second PhD was on research in Comparative Constitutional Law, University of Kansas Law School, USA. He has held both academic and professional positions with oversight functions. Who is my guest? You'll be meeting him right after this timeout. Stay with me. Welcome back. It is time to meet my guest. And who is he? Join me as I welcome Professor Jehu Onyekwere Naji, PhD. Welcome to this program. Thank you so much. All right. Now, we will be looking at um, some of your various contributions and how you've been able to use that knowledge to impact society. Let me start with... Um, you being judge to the International Criminal Court, ICC, and Mock Cup Cut Competition, MCC, sitting at The Hague, Netherlands, 2017 till date. And you said that is uh, in collaboration with the International Bar Association, London, UK. What Thanks. has been your major, major contributions there? Thank you so much. Uh, let me start by explaining the contribution of the International Criminal Court. As you are aware, it is uh, an international court that tends to look at cases which uh, national jurisdictions cannot handle. It's based on complement complementarity, which is principle of complement complementarity, which means if a national jurisdiction cannot handle a case, that means that case will be referred to the International Criminal Court, like war crimes, genocide, as, as you may have it. Because most national jurisdictions may decide to uh, stay away from handling such cases. So if that national jurisdiction is a party or a signatory to the ICC, that makes the case to be sent to ICC for investigation. So that means that particular culprit or the person who has committed that offense will be transferred to The Hague, depending on the jurisdiction of the case at the matter. So now, uh, having looked at that situation, now it's important for us to know that people from different uh, participating countries have their law students who also want to be equipped with international legal uh, practice. So what we do at The Hague and this ICC, MCC, is to equip the law uh, graduates who will eventually become graduates and the uh, practitioners, as the case may be, to be well informed as to the legal uh, you know, jurisdiction that is uh, prevailing in a given situation when a particular case is committed. So who are these uh, judges who are selected? They are selected from across all member countries. Nigeria, which is a part, is also uh, a contributory uh, nation to that. So they will take jurists from different uh, countries, judges and uh, lawyers, of international repute, as well as uh, professors of law who will also take part in this very uh, tribunal or this very court. So it is uh, an international uh, court that actually looks at this uh, situation. So the International Bar Association, being an umbrella body for legal practitioners around the world, which is international in nature, seeks to you know, upgrade this very status so that people will uh, see what happens at the international uh, level. OK, that's good to know. Now, you're also a professor and consultant in civil and criminal matters at the Italian Ministry of Justice and at the High Courts of Naples, 
and Santa Maria Capua Vetere? Capua Vetere. Capua Vetere. Yes. Okay. Italy. All right. Um, what do you do there also? Absolutely. Uh, it is important to know that, uh, you know, legal uh, jurisdictions vary across the world. So, as you are aware, in uh, Nigeria we practice a common law system and Italy is a civil law system where uh, judges are involved in investigations. Whereas in uh, the common law system is a different uh, scenario. So, when uh, there is a case to be investigated, so we normally, you know, put these investigations on uh, track to make sure that these people are already well, you know, uh, you know uh, established as the criminals before eventually the court procedure can take place. So what happens is that uh, if a particular person is being uh, suspected to have committed a crime, so you do not uh, see the person as a criminal until the person is already convicted. So you must have ample evidence, which will uh, were pre-trial uh, you know, procedures, which will involve uh, you know, using some other methods, which I will not uh, disclose here, to track these criminals. So when this is done and uh, this person is brought to book, so there will be no, no little or no uh, effort or room of escape for this person. So this is what we normally do to track criminals. Of course, you know, mafia is endemic in uh, Italy. It's a mafia country. So most of these crimes are related uh, to mafia. So uh, most of these uh, investigations are anti-mafia investigations, which of course, not only Italians now, but those who have also migrated to Italy also, you know, join ranks with them. So this is uh, an omnibus uh, approach to tracking the criminals. Well, lead detective and investigator to the courts of Naples and Santa Maria at the Italian Ministry of Justice in conjunction with the Italian judiciary and military police. What have been your activities? The activities uh, are not uh, far-fetched. So most of the activities are criminal in nature because you have civil matters, you have criminal matters. So most of these uh, activities are criminal matters. As you are aware, uh, you know, Italy has uh, been a home for many migrants yes. across the world, especially those who come from uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and as well Asia and elsewhere. So, and uh, the essence of uh, this migration, most of them will tell you, is to look for greener pastures. But of course, we know that, uh, in fact, let me try to, you know, uh, rephrase what uh, an Italian migrant said in New York in 1910. So he thought that when he arrives in uh, New York, everywhere will be paved with gold. But by the time he arrived in New York on a rickety boat, he discovered that no gold was found on the streets. But he had to now pave the roads himself. So it is important for people to know that migration is only uh, you know, a tincture of someone's uh, speculation of a particular location even before the person arrives there. So most of these people, because they already have a mindset, they're going to make money. Mm. So by the time they reach there, they become uh, very you know, uh, susceptible to some other scams, you know, which eventually most of them are unsuspecting. And they become uh, you know, uh, victims of scams. And they become uh, you know, involved in uh, crimes even without knowing it. So what happens is that most of these people are already uh, in trouble just because they have a contravent one law or the other. But like you know, the, the law is uh, equal for everyone and the uh, ignorance of the law is not an excuse you know, towards prosecution. So most of them become victims and uh, when that happens, they are brought to book. So in this, uh, my involvement is to make sure that those who are already found uh, you know, you know, to have contravened the law are actually you know, prosecuted uh, adequately in line with the law. All right. You're also a professor and a conference convener and chairman of International Political Science Association, IPSA, Montreal, Canada. What have you been able to do with this position? Yes, uh, as you are aware, you know, um, conferences are, you know, enabling uh, environments for people to, you know, showcase their rights, write-ups and, uh, you know, papers of international repute. So if you must uh, be recognized in an uh, academic world, you must have uh, submitted papers to some conferences, you must have been also been participant of uh, some conferences across the world. So having been uh, you know, inducted as a, a convener as well as the chair of most of these uh, conferences, which is headquarters is in Montreal, Canada, I've been able to assemble uh, papers from around the world. In fact, the last one we were supposed to hold was supposed to be in July, it was supposed to be in Lisbon, Portugal. But that program was eventually shifted because of the pandemic, okay. because people could no longer come for in-person uh, conference. We were going to do it virtually. Then, uh, of course, we had so many other places like in the uh, you know, United States and elsewhere. So most of these conferences are you know, an avenue for people to welcome uh, papers that people want to probably want to become professors, those who want to become uh, you know, skilled writers. So we assemble them, and once papers are approved on that very forum, ensures that you are a writer of international repute, so, and your papers will go in the pool so that people can consult them you know, in the web. Okay, I also read from your CV that you're president of uh, a network which, that goes by name Globe Visions. Network. And it has to do with um, this migration and integration of people. Now, you were, earlier on, you were talking about um, Asian and Africans that migrate to Italy. 
of what benefit is your network really um, to Africans, particularly Nigerians, that do migrate to Italy? Very good. Uh, this Global Nations uh, uh, Visions Network uh, has been in Italy for nearly a decade now. And uh, the essence was uh, under the auspices of the Italian government because uh, being a Nigerian who has been uh, there and has uh, risen to a level that was uh, recognizable by the state of uh, Italy, uh, they feel that if there's any involvement of uh, Nigerians in any situation, they must call my own opinion. So I always tell them that uh, it's not only when Nigerians have problems, they must call me, but we need to nip these problems in the board. So when these migrants come, there must be a way of uh, schooling them, you know, making them understand that the places they have uh, arrived are not like where we were coming from. Because, you know, uh, we have laws in Nigeria, not that we don't have laws. Probably maybe the process of uh, implementation and enforcement may be different. But elsewhere, like in uh, Europe and the uh, United States, it's not like that. So people are brought to book just because they have contravened a, a law that Nigerians will see as simple. So most of them are unaware of this very, you know, implication. So this Global Visions Network was actually at the auspices of the Italian government to help to salvage these migrants, to teach them the right things to do. And most of them, when they arrive, they do not know they need to have valid purpose. They think that it's just arriving and go there on the street and make money. So, but this uh, association has uh, enabled them to be you know, well integrated into the society. Some of them were looking for jobs and were able to find jobs for them. Those who were you know, rehabilitated were also put in the, in the mainstream uh, employment. Because, of course, some of them come and because of uh, pressure, you know, from their friends, you know, and colleagues. They now enter into drug uh, trafficking, which of course is, uh, you know, uh, deleterious to health. And uh, we are aware that most of them have been in prison over a period of time. So when they come out from prison, they need to be rehabilitated because most of those people are already, you know, you know uh, suffering a kind of trauma. So either we teach them skills or show them the right way to become legitimate, uh, you know, you know, residents of this uh, country where they have visited. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that we have done in the past. Okay, there was a time killing of Nigerians came to the front burner, really, in the country, in Italy. You know, Nigerians were being killed and hacked down. Really, did your network do anything about it? Were you aware of it at all? Yes, I'm very, very much aware. Uh, the very recent one was uh, uh, 2019, to be precise. Because uh, you see, um, there were some Nigerians who were involved in uh, this uh, undocumented uh, work. So some of them entered the hinterland to go and work. And, of course, that area is where you cannot uh, document immigrants properly, but the police network is able to penetrate these very, you know, suburbs. Oh. So, and uh, some of them had a crash, you know, in a rickety vehicle that they were, you know, using to go to farm work. So what happened there was that uh, two Nigerians lost their lives. So immediately that happened, I was caught upon, and in fact through uh, the Nigerian embassy in Rome. So I was able to reach the families. Of course, nobody can uh, bring back the dead. But of course, there must be something to be done to you know, compensate the families. So because assuming that the people were well informed, they wouldn't have died. Because most of those jobs are like slavery jobs. You know, they, they, they treat, them, treat them as slaves. So they pay them peanuts and they start from them. Because it's like an employer paying through an intermediary, intermediary, and intermediary paying to them. So by the time the money trickles down to the employee, it is peanuts. Yes, no. And uh, they lost their lives for just peanuts. And uh, that was where I took up the case. And eventually, some of them were compensated adequately. We cannot blame the dead, but the families uh, got recompense for that. Wow, wow. You are still watching Guest of the Week, this beautiful day. My guest is still in the house. This conversation continues in just a moment. Stay with me. Welcome back. Now back to my guests. At a point, you were also professor and scientific member of a group of researchers in international law under the auspices of the Italian National Research Council on the theme, Synelagmatic Relationship Between Disarmament and Nuclear Non-Proliferation, Strengthening Treaty Obligations and Countering nuclear terrorism. Holistically, tell us what this means. It's like it means uh, the association of researchers that come together to bring their wealth of experience in order to study the ways and means of combating terrorism and nuclear disarmament. 
or uh, combating nuclear armament. So you can uh, agree with me that most countries have uh, gone nuclear in terms of their prohibition of uh, you know, weapons. So this research was meant to stem the tide in this very direction. So all our research findings were submitted to help the government make uh, informed decisions as to how to you know, you know, curtail the involvement of countries and then to dissuade them from uh, going further in nuclear acquisition. So that uh, fell under the, you know, the shoulder of the university where I was a professor and then uh, we were given that contract to handle and the Italian National Research Council was well eventually awarded the contract because of the level of uh, financial uh, involvement, the, the academic excellence was uh, you know, one thing that they could not uh, you know, dispense with and we submitted that academic excellence and eventually the, the research was a success. Wow. You belong to some professional associations and professional bodies. Some of these professional bodies, what do you do in them? Uh, I'm a member of the uh, British Institute of International and Pro uh, Comparative Law, which is BICL, and also a member of the International Bar Association, as well as the American Political Science Association and the International Law Society of the United States, and uh, as well as the International. Uh, the Law Society of the United States. So it is important for us to know that these associations are umbrella bodies for professionals around the world. And uh, no uh, person is an island. So what happens in most of these associations is that there must be a consortium of uh, persons who will come mm -hmm. to bring their wealth of uh, experience you know, to bear on the, the association. So what we normally do in this place, from time to time there are conferences and seminars and workshops which we attend elsewhere around the world, depending on the location and the organization that is hosting it. So people will come from different places and they bring their own uh, efforts uh, long before the uh, events we hold. So topics and themes as well as the areas of uh, discussion will be you know, sent across so that people can bring the very research information to the table. Mm -hmm. So, and I have been a very principal contributor to these associations in terms of being a chair and a convener at different occasions and at different times. So I've been very, very helpful in this very, very direction. Some of these workshops and seminars you're talking about, what's their impact? The layman would say, you know, you go there and uh, there are lots of grammar you speak there. But really, when you go for such seminars and workshops, when you come back, of what importance, what impact does it make in the society? Well, as you are aware, there is a difference between for policy formulation and uh, implementation. So when some of these uh, findings are, you know, reached, these, uh, you know, recommendations are sent across to different uh, governments. So, but it all depends on the political will of this uh, government to actually, you know, put these uh, recommendations in uh, force. In the course of your job, you've also been um, awarded, you know, various honors, awards and things like that. Could you share a few of them with us? Yes. Uh, let me start with uh, the one in the United States where I was made a visiting scholar. It was a very uh, high profile position which uh, is going to, you know, deserving persons around the world who have distinguished themselves in academic areas. So the University of Kansas, you know, gave me that honor because uh, after all the submissions made, I was considered to be eligible, you know, and then uh, was uh, honored with that uh, very award, uh, which of course was approved by the United States Department of State and the uh, Department of Homeland Security, which is the highest uh, security uh, architecture of the United States. So that means that for somebody to hold that position, must be crime free. You, you have zero tolerance on corruption and your record is impeccable. So that means that they must have researched about you before the US Department of State will approve that this person will be given that position. And that is uh, one of them. Then the British Institute of International and Comparative Law have been in that position also as a scholar that because uh, having researched and uh, submitted the useful information that will help to you know, bring about international law under a common umbrella. So that has been an award that has also been uh, under my feathers. So, I have contributed immensely in that regard. Then uh, coming to Italy, I was also a Merit Award winner of the University of Naples, where I was adjudged the best author of a particular uh, event, which the university honored me during the epoch-making event. And that was very commendable. All right. Um, you know, as a professor of many years, you've also been involved in supervision and a lot of oversight functions. Um, PhD students and maybe even, you know, other areas. Looking at um, the standard of education or our educational system here, you've um, been in Italy, you've studied there, you're also teaching there. You've had a brush with the UK and um, also with the US. 
holistically tell us, the system we run here, you've, you've been back in the country also, you've looked at what we had. Can it be compared with what you saw abroad? Well, um, the answer will be a double barrel uh, response. Uh, the level of intellectualism, you know, can be compared mm -hmm. because the brain cells are the same. The Nigerian brain is the same thing as the US brain or the European brain. Nothing changed because the brain cells function virtually the same. But what happens is the input so, and the environment under which we study. You know, I remember during my undergraduate days at University of Benin, you know, uh, the situation I saw there is not what is obtainable now. You know, and uh, when people don't have the congenial atmosphere to study, it affects their level of uh, input and uh, in terms of uh, academic excellence. Mm -hmm. So you cannot expect a class that is supposed to take 40 persons to now take 200. So this is not tenable at all. So what happens in order to put the question and the answer in perspective is the fact that in overseas, United States or elsewhere in Europe, they understand the carrying capacity of a class, and that is what is done. But here we tend to overadmit. Even if we do not overadmit, we don't have the fac facilities to accommodate the students yes. because students need these facilities. If a uh, class is supposed to be for 40, it should be 40, not 200. Not because we want to make money by admitting so that people will not have money to themselves. That will not put the students under a perilous environment to study. So that affects the level of uh, study because people cannot study in a, under an environment that is not congenial to, to, to academic uh, you know, uh, pursuit. Mm. One may be wondering really, what are some of the qualities that have helped you to succeed as an individual? Very good question. Uh, resilience and patience. Uh, it's not actually easy to excel in anything. If you don't want to be a cobbler, it takes patience and resilience. You know, uh, we have a country, uh, or call our own like Nigeria, but uh, there are certain things that are not in place for us here in terms of academic pursuit. Mm. I remember those days, during my undergraduate days, people used to get small bursaries here and there, states will issue, but I don't think that is very common now, except for some very uh, you know, rich areas. So that also affects education because someone who is studying, needs to be sure that he has money to get the handouts, the, do the photocopies, even, even to eat, means of subsistence, subsistence. So that affects the, the students and the performance as well. So for me, coming from a Nigerian background and going uh, elsewhere, where things are a little bit, uh, you know, organized, a little better organized than where I was coming from, it gave me an ample opportunity to even uh, excel because I've seen the harder days. So I believe that uh, what kept me going was the resilience and patience because I knew that I was uh, there to achieve something, not just because uh, I was just in overseas to go and look at the beautiful environment, but just to go and get something tangible and uh, bring back something home. Okay. Um, what's your advice to the youths of today? Most times their focus is um, on how to make it. They want to get rich. They want wealth at the expense of any other thing. What's your advice to them? My advice is that I've always told people that come my way, especially the youths, that before you can, uh, you know, get, you know, uh, uh, process success in your business environment, you must process your brain. So you must develop your brain in order to process these developments, you know, economically. But most of them are always interested in making the money. But if you make the money, you don't have the brain, the money will still go all the same, one way or the other. That's it on this edition of the program, Guest of the Week. I want to thank you so much for watching, and I want to thank my guest, Professor... Jehu Onyekwere Nnaji PhD for coming to this very program today. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure having you. And for youths, remain focused. Know exactly that which is important. Focus and do that. Resilience, patience, very important. If you have these, surely you will excel. I'm Jane Madwaguna, your host. Thank you. Join me again next week. Bye-bye.